evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Italy. I've got this wide angle for you here with lots of shadows and things with my lighting so that you can really see a, a big overview of Italy's geography. I'll change the angle before history and so you could see the, the pages in the book a little better. But let's talk about geography of this amazing country to start the video. Italy is located on the Mediterranean coast of Europe. It is bordered by France up here. It has this border with Switzerland, this border with Austria, and this border with Slovenia. Now, that's not the only borders, although it looks like it. There are two other countries within Italy. We have San Marino right here. And we have within Rome, Vatican City. It's, I can't even trace it. It's too tiny. I just posted a video on the Vatican yesterday. You can check out that out. But let's talk about the, the northern border. We'll work our way south. So starting up here, you can see this area is dominated by some huge mountains known as the Alps. The highest of these mountains is Mont Blanc. It's right here on the border with France. There's also a really interesting mountain range here called the Dolomites, um, which are big... Um, they're kind of like spiky looking. <laughs> they're not quite like a regular mountain. They're very pointy. <laughs> they're interesting though. And of course, up here you have lots of snow, lots of glaciers, lots of glacier melt, which makes lots of beautiful lakes and skiing adventures and all those wonderful things that are associated with the mountains and the Alps in particular. Let me see, we move further down into this area, you can see the mountains drop off abruptly into this area known as the Po Valley. And the Po Valley is thusly dominated by the Po River, you can see over here. Around the river here, the land is very, very fertile. Lots of farming land, lots of vineyards. Um, all the, the, the delicious and amazing agriculture associated with Italy is primarily grown in this region. There are some very major cities up here. We have Milan right here, the, the fashion capital of the world. There's Turin, big uh, history city. Um, I always think about the Olympics when I think of Turin. It was there one year. And um, among many others, we're not going to list them all, but at the end of the Po River, at the mouth here, we have the, the Foci del Po. And just up here, we have a very interesting city, Venice, which you'll see pictures. There's actually a picture on the cover here of Venice, one of the beautiful canals. But Venice is unusual in that it is situated on a bunch of very tiny islands and there are no roads, there are only canals, and everyone gets around by boat. I just think that's so fascinating. Over here we have the Gulf of Genoa. You can see Genoa right here. This area here is known as the Italian Riviera. And it's, you know, the, the actual French Riviera is just over here. You can see Monaco's over here. And uh, it's... All the things associated with the Riviera, luxurious beaches and luxurious everything, to be honest. In central Italy, you could see that we've got some more mountains going straight all the way, look, watch out for the shadows, all the way down the entire peninsula here. These mountains are known as the Apennines. And uh, not quite as like mighty and powerful as the Alps up here, but nonetheless, they're also very volcanic. There's quite a few volcanoes in this area. Um, they're mostly down in the south, though. Uh, in 
the the central part we get a few more interesting fertile zones along the coastline here you can see this is the big lake area over here this is Marche um, oh I should note up here you can see that's Lombardy that's Piedmont we've got um, Tuscany's right here probably the most like like when you picture Italy or Italian countryside you're thinking of Tuscany it's gorgeous and beautiful and then we come down here and we have the city of Rome the capital city with uh, so much history and architecture and art I mean not to mention <laughs> there are many other places that have incredible art and architecture all throughout Italy right um, but Rome is the, the the real like part of the country, right? Let's move further down. You could see that the mountains start to dominate the coastline here. There's Naples, where pizza was invented. That's my favorite food, I have to mention it. <laughs> and um, over here is a region known as Puglia. It's more of like a, a flat land. I don't know how to describe it. It's um, a lot more grassy and not quite as fertile as the rest of Italy. It is fertile, just not as much. And let's see, um, we move down to the islands here in the Mediterranean. This is Sicily, the largest island in the Mediterranean. And you can see it's very, very mountainous. Oh, and the, the volcanoes. We have Mount Etna right here, which is very hard to say with my accent. In California, we'd say Edna. Mount Etna is an extremely active volcano. Um, but we also have Mount Vesuvius up here, which is very famous for uh, blowing up and destroying two ancient Roman cities, Pompeii and Herculaneum. Uh, but yeah, many others. And then... We have, the, let me move the book, hold on. This is going to fall. <laughs> this wasn't going to last for long. Sardinia over here. Um, and as you could see, also very mountainy. We've got um, mountains and volcanoes on this island as well. Uh, Sicily and Sardinia are incredibly important to Italy's history. They're not to be forgotten when you think of Italy. I know people just think of the boot, but don't forget these islands, along with many other islands up here. You can see the Tuscan archipelago up here with Elba is right here. Uh, Capri is another one right there. That's like a vacation island. And as you can see on here, there are many different seas within the Mediterranean Sea that surrounds Italy. Up here we have the Ligurian Sea, or the Ligurian Sea, I can't, I've heard both. <laughs> we have the Tyrrhenian Sea right here, the Ionian Sea, the Adriatic Sea, and, oh that's just the Mediterranean Sea. I was about to say, I don't think there's any others that I wrote down. Uh, but yeah, many other islands you could see where there's Stromboli, another volcano. And... Let me see. I'm looking over to make sure I've included everything. I'll, I'll point out the rest as I go, I suppose. <laughs> Florence is an important city. Um, it's kind of art capital of Italy. <laughs> Pisa, famous for the Leaning Tower. So on and so forth. Let me change this angle. This arm is really wide and broad, but if you breathe too hard, it wobbles, and I don't like that, so let me switch to a better angle. <laughs> I know, a lot more zoomed in, but a lot more stable. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to start our story in Rome, I suppose. But there were early humans in this part of the world about 40,000 years ago, even evidence of Neanderthals from about 200,000 years ago. And there were many different cultures much later than that. Um, throughout the peninsula here, throughout the boat, the boat, the boot, you know what I mean. 
uh, the Umbrians were here. There were some Celts, some Samnites. Um, but the, the most important ones are going to be the Etruscans and the Latins. So Tuscanies, named for the Etruscans. And the, <laughs> the Latins is where we get the Latin language and everything. And they would be the ones that would establish Rome, blending a lot of Etruscan cultures and ways of life into this kind of amalgamation of a city which would become Rome, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, meanwhile, down on the islands here, Sicily and Sardinia, I was realized, like, you can't really see them anyway with this angle. Um, they were first uh, colonized by the Phoenicians, who were based in what's now Lebanon. They were big-time sailors. They sailed all over the Mediterranean, building colonies and things. So... That what was happening down there. The Latins and the Tuscans up here founding their city had a cultural exchange with the Mycenaean Greeks. The Greeks built uh, little towns and colonies down in the, the south here, which they interacted with the people up here, influenced their culture. And by the year 509 BCE, the Romans expelled their king and created the Roman Republic which is a, a lot like the Rome you, you think of today. They quickly grew in power, especially uh, after having many conquests throughout the more northern and some of the southern here, uh, expanding, expanding the territory. They had a big victory in Carthage during the Punic Wars when a former colony of the Phoenicians became more powerful than the Phoenicians. The city was called Carthage. They attempted to invade Rome very famously by uh, marching some elephants over the Alps <laughs> to attack. Thanks, Topol, for that demonstration. Um, and Rome was victorious at the end of all the Punic Wars, dominated the coast of northern Africa, and then a general named Julius Caesar really upped the ante and started to invade way further up into what's now France, was on his Gaul, going into the British Isles, spreading out the Roman territory all throughout most of the European continent. He grew so powerful, he became known as the dictator, kind of the world's first official dictator, as in he pretty much had all of the power which many, many people in the Roman Senate did not like, so they killed him on March 15th, 44 BCE. He would wind up getting replaced by his nephew. He would declare himself emperor and thus sparked the Roman Empire. He went by the name Augustus Caesar, and this is when the empire really truly extended its reach out far into Britain, all the way out to Syria, and then, like I said, further expansions in Northern Africa. It was a very, very powerful civilization and uh, revolutionized a lot of things. They built aqueducts, which changed the way that uh, water could be distributed throughout the empire. They built magnificent roads, many of which still stand today, and there's just a huge legacy from Rome, right? We've got gladiators, we've got a uh, chariots, um, uh, we've got Pompeii, there's, there, there's too much to talk about ancient Rome, to be honest. I'll have many other videos about it later on, most likely next year. But the empire became too big, and the best idea was to split the empire into, in the year 3, 95 CE, it was split into the Western Empire, which was still headquartered in Rome, and the Eastern Empire was headquartered in a city known as Byzantium, and became known as the Byzantine Empire, since it grew far more powerful than the rest of the Roman Empire. That city would eventually be renamed Constantinople after one of the emperors, Constantine, who introduced Christianity into the empire, and converted a majority of the citizens, eventually, all of them, in a way. 
But like I said, the Western Empire became increasingly weaker. The Byzantine Empire became increasingly stronger. All the power was really over there. And then the barbarians started to invade. Um, mainly there was, um, there's too many. There were the Vandals, there were the, the Goths. Um, one of the most important barbarian leaders was Odiaser. He invaded Rome in 476, and that pretty much marked the end of the classical Roman Empire as we know it today. They ransacked the place and left everything to just kind of fall apart. There was another, by the way, barbarian means they didn't speak Latin. It doesn't mean they were like savage and dirty. I mean, they probably were, let's face it, but, um, the word barbarian at that time just meant that they weren't Roman, they weren't Latin. So there was another barbarian group known as the Lombards, which settled up here in what's now Lombardy. They were kind of becoming the more central power in the area until Emperor Charlemagne came along from another tribe known as the Franks, which would eventually become France. He conquered the area and eventually conquered the rest of Italy and got all the, the barbarian invaders out and unified everything into a, a strong empire force. The Pope in Rome in Vatican City was very grateful for Charlemagne and crowned him Holy Roman Emperor and thus creating a, a sort of dual empire where there would be an emperor in charge of the, the management of the empire in a way and the Pope would be in charge of the religious aspects and more of the behind the scenes big picture ideas very much hand in hand. The area down here started to slowly get controlled by the Pope. It was an area known as the Papal States. And uh, yes, it's, it's weird to think about now, but back then the Pope had like a lot of political power. So this was essentially all his at the time. But in other parts of Italy, especially along the coastlines and along the rivers here, city-states started to thrive. A lot of the big cities I pointed out um, really started to grow. Each one would have a different industry. Usually there would be a family that would develop that industry and become incredibly wealthy and put a lot of money back into the cities, beautifying them, and the, the city would just improve and become their own powerful, flourishing city-states. The most notable ones I mentioned before, there's Florence, there's Milan, um, and Venice for a minute was like the most powerful one in that they had a lot of trade connections and had their fingers in a lot of pots in the trade of um, Western Asia, Eastern Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, like I kind of said before, Milan was more about fashion and textiles. Florence was more about um, art. Um, the family that controlled Florence were the Medicis. They were actually part of the wool industry, but they became so filthy rich that they just became nobility, <laughs> married into royal families and things like that, and just lived like that. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, for the... The Middle Ages, that was pretty much what Italy was at the time. Also in Florence, there is this poet named Dante who wrote a very influential poem, which was essentially Bible fan fiction called The Divine Comedy. It spread all over Italy. People loved it, especially since he wrote it in the Florentine language. It was not in Latin. And you know, people read it, they started speaking that language, and that's how we get Italian today. Modern Italian came out of the kind of Florentine language. What's happening down in the islands here? Because last time we checked in with them, the Phoenicians were controlling them, and uh, they're long gone by now. <laughs> they were, of course, controlled by the Roman Empire when that was a thing. After that fell, who conquered it? Well, that's a great question. Pretty much everybody. <laughs> Everyone hopped onto these islands and controlled it for a while. Uh, Sicily, for the most part, was under Arab control until the Normans, 
who were a, uh, a peoples from kind of like northwestern France would invade and take over, um, let's see, Sardinia over here came under the control of Spain, um, more specifically Aragon, because there wasn't really a Spain back then, it was divided into different kingdoms at that time. Uh, eventually, further into history, the uh, various families of Spain, royal families of Spain, and the Habsburgs, who were ruling the Holy Roman Empire, wound up intermarrying and combining empires. So eventually, both islands came under the control of the Spanish Habsburgs. Um, so just make a note of that. The 1400s roll around. Uh, Constantinople falls to the Arabs. It becomes Istanbul, the capital of the Ottoman Empire. And now it is the boots' time to shine. This is when the Renaissance begins. It really started in Florence, thanks to the Medicis, who had so much money they didn't have anything else to spend it on, so they bought it on lavish art and beautiful buildings for the city, which inspired other city-states to build beautiful buildings and pay artists to make beautiful art, and it spread all throughout Italy. It was an area known as, an, oh my gosh, I'm talking too fast. It spread throughout Italy. It was an era known as the Renaissance. Eventually, the Renaissance would spread all throughout Europe, but it was beginning it's I'm going way too fast whenever I go too fast that means I'm excited so I'm so happy to be doing Italy the renaissance began in Italy and started out strong um, there's also the age of discovery at this time like I said Italy was made up of city-states and they were more concerned about art and architecture right um Meanwhile, Spain and Portugal were very excited about navigation. That's where they were putting their money into. So many Italians hopped over to Spain and Portugal to lead expeditions around the world. The most famous one being Christopher Columbus, of course. Um, Amerigo Vespucci is how we get the word America for the Americas. Uh, there's also John Cabot, as he's known today. He was from Italy. He wound up actually going to um, England and uh, exploring Canada and all down into, like, southern Canada. <laughs> but good times would kind of end with an era known as the Counter-Reformation. So the Pope in Rome at this time. The, the papacy is incredibly corrupt, as you can imagine, when you get that involved in politics. Um, a lot of money just went into the pocket of the Pope. I mean, if you saw my Vatican City video, you know that they poured so much money into art and architecture, like an obscene amount. Uh, and in order to do that, they uh, swindled a lot of money from people and siphoned a lot of money from the empire into the pocket of the Pope. Many people outside of Italy were very upset by this. They didn't consider that to be very Christian whatsoever, which, in my opinion, I agree. I mean, it's nice to have a pretty church, but, I mean, come on. It doesn't need to be that pretty. The Protestants who were protesting the, pardon me, the actions of the Catholic Church uh, believed more like a simplicity kind of thing. So, uh, the area here counteracted that, hence the counter-reformation. Various wars would break out between, that's, that's a big generalization, various wars throughout Europe would break out. Um, there is also moments like uh, Galileo, a scientist, um, I believe from Pisa, who was like, hey, I built this telescope and I can see all these moons in Jupiter. Also, I think the earth goes around the sun. And the Pope was like, you're crazy, you're under house arrest forever, which happened. Like, all of the um, expansion of knowledge and art and wonder of the Renaissance was pretty much over at this time. Galileo didn't stand a chance. And for the most part, it weakened 
the, the state of things in Italy. Eventually, a nationalist movement would form where people thought, what if instead of just a bunch of different regions on this peninsula, we all combined and became one country? Which made sense. I mean, the cultures were all very different, but they all spoke the same language, had a lot of similarities, and things were kind of falling apart. So why not merge and become one big powerful country? The unification revolution was mainly led by a man named Giuseppe Garibaldi. There were many heroes of this time, but he's kind of like number one, the George Washington of this revolution. He teamed up with Sardinia, which had a kingdom. At this time, it was King Victor Emmanuel II. He was like, I like this idea, Giuseppe, but um, once everything's united, we can have a kingdom. And Garibaldi's like, well, I was kind of thinking it would be more of like a republic, like ancient Rome was, electing our leaders and having a senate. Um, they uh, agreed to disagree for now so that they could team up and start invading Italy from the bottom up. Eventually they were successful and eventually Garibaldi caved and allowed Italy to become a kingdom. Um, did I say Sard I meant Sicily, hello. I'm pretty sure. You can't see it anyway. Um, Victor Emmanuel was the king of Sicily. Why did I write Sardinia in my notes? I have no idea. Anyway, um, but Sardinia did join up. Let's be real. Um, so the Kingdom of Italy was formed in 1861, and then the Italians, now that they had their own country and kingdom, had some notions, you know, many European powers at this time were colonizing places, so Italy rushed to find something to colonize. By the 1890s, they had invaded Somalia and what's now Eritrea. They'd eventually hop down to Libya and invade there, claiming that, you know, that was ancient Roman territory, that's their heritage, you know, it's rightfully theirs. They would attempt to invade into what's now Ethiopia, but they would be kicked out by the people here and <laughs> get out of here. World War One happens, Italy fights alongside the Allies, and they get I mean, they win, but they get beat pretty bad, and the country winds up going bankrupt. And there's a lot of unrest, politically, economically, culturally, to be honest. Communism was on the rise all throughout Europe, and it definitely was in Italy. The king at the time was not a fan of communism. He did not like that, because communism's kind of anti-king, you know? There's another movement forming known as fascism, which was like hyper-nationalism, like to the extreme, led by a man named Benito Mussolini. Uh, Mussolini had planned a big march on the capital to uh, what the king assumed was to overthrow the monarchy and a coup. So instead, he said, you know what, Mussolini, you can be the prime minister, you can implement your fascist ideas all throughout Italy and implement them he did let me turn over my notes my notebook's all like scribbled all over it and it makes some really good page sounds so let me carefully turn the page in my notes i have a lot of notes on italy as you can tell uh, yeah so his gang were known as the black shirts and uh, once Mussolini became prime minister. He wound up becoming the dictator of Italy. Uh, he became buddy buddies with some guy up in Germany who was leading that country. They shared a lot of ideas. So they <laughs> joined with him when World War II broke out and fought on his side starting in 1940. Um, oh, also at this time, <laughs> or kind of before World War II would officially happen, um, they went back to Ethiopia and managed to conquer it. Along as with the Balkan states over here, they started to try to expand out just like their Roman ancestors had done. But then World War II got in the way. The Allies started to invade in 1943, um, bombing as they went. Uh, the king, Victor Emmanuel III, deposed Mussolini. He was like, this has been the worst idea ever. Get out of my country. He was arrested, 
so that um, the king could kind of surrender to the allies and try to end all the fighting and bombing. But the Germans invaded, they rescued Mussolini from jail, they took him up to the north to create a Nazi puppet state, and various rebels and um, communists and various allies were fighting the Nazis up there. Eventually, Mussolini would be found and killed, ending that civil war for good. In 1946, Italy became a republic. They said, you know what, we tried this monarchy thing, I don't think it's working out. Let's try the republic thing. They released their colonies, for one thing, by Libya, by Ethiopia, Eritrea, where they still speak a lot of Italian, by the way. Um, and they focused more on the economy and industry, and it really boomed. Uh, most famously at this time, cars were produced, stuff like, you know, Ferrari, Lamborghinis, all the fancy, fancy Italian cars that we know and love. They're such beautiful cars. They also joined the European Economic Community, which would eventually become the EU, which really helped the economy as an economic community anyway. However, a communist movement would spark up in the 1960s, 1970s. This era became known as the Years of Lead, which really kind of slowed down all of the economic prosperity of the country. Uh, they, there were terrorist bombings from the Red Brigades, they called themselves sort of like the underground communist fighters. Not to mention the Mafia started to become a thing coming up from... Sicily and along the the south of Italy here and a lot of government corruption began at this time mainly to do with the mafia you know um, that didn't help things either that was eventually curbed in the 1990s in Operation Clean Hands where around 700 people and politicians were arrested uh, being accused of corruption criminal activities and all of that there is still an issue of corruption in Italy. There are still quite a lot of political scandals that the politicians face. Way too many to list. Pretty much um, every Italian leader that's had a prominent role in politics has wound up resigning in disgrace due to some kind of scandal, you know. Uh, most famously would have been Bernaleschi, who was a very corrupt dude. Um, most recently, um, there is Giuseppe Conte, who resigned in 2021. Other issues facing Italy, uh, the 2008 crisis hurt the economy a lot in Italy, really ground that progress to a halt again, but it's been picking up. However, in the mid-2010s, Italy was faced with a migrant crisis due to a lot of unrest in Northern Africa and the Middle East. A lot of people hopped on whatever they could that floated and wound up in Italy. They took in many refugees, but you can only take in you know, so many people before your house is too full. So that was an issue as well, but for the most part, that's the history of Italy. An adventure, I know. So many ups and downs in this country, but what remains is that this landscape and culture is some of the most beautiful in the world, right? Absolutely fascinating. Let's look at some pictures of Italy in the book. Here we see the big Duomo of Florence and a gondolier driving a, a gondola in the canals of Venice. Come on. Here's the Colosseum in Rome, an old Roman amphitheater, the largest one they ever built for their gladiator battles and various blood sport entertainments. There's a political map of Italy. You can see all the big cities there. Some kids playing some soccer in the streets there. And some old men having a chit chat on the bench. <laughs> they all look really sweet. Here's those Dolomite Mountains I told you about. Very pointy pointy. I like exploring the boot. <laughs> Some very old buildings here. I think this is Milan, I'm pretty sure. Here is Mont Blanc. Big ol' ICI up there. 
Here's a nice little physical map of Italy. You can see all the things, all the different peninsulas, rivers. I didn't mention the Tiber River. It's, uh, you know, not the most prominent river in Italy, but it's famous because it flows through Rome. You can see the Latium Plain there. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else I skipped during geography. North Italian Plain up here. Lake Cuomo I didn't mention. Lake Gorda. Gorda I didn't mention. That's the biggest lake. All that flow from the glaciers, you know. Things like that. The Leaning Tower of Pisa. Going a little sideways. Apparently they fixed it so it's not leaning as much because they're afraid it's gonna lean to all the way. <laughs> Become a, a 180 degree angle building. This is the National Park of Abruzzo, Lazio, and Molise. Look at these beautiful wildflowers. And this is in San Marino, which San Marino is going to get its own video down the road, so we'll learn more about it then. The gorgeous countryside. See, like, when you picture, like, Tuscany, you know, Roman countryside, you see the vines and the green and everything. And then the beautiful coastline. This is in Puglia, very rocky area, kind of more Greek-ish kind of an area. This is in Sardinia, some really incredible rocks that have been blown by the wind for years longer than we can comprehend, so they have some really cool shapes. Here's Mount Etna, blowing its top non-stop. <laughs> that rhymed. <laughs> um, this is Pompeii. What happened when Vesuvius erupted and covered the city in pyroclastic ash and buried it and thus preserved it. There's also a lot of earthquakes in Italy. It's a very seismically active place, so earthquakes happen from time to time. Some snow here in Milan. They're having some fun sledding time down the hill. And this is in Sicily to kind of show how foggy it can get. It's a really nice picture though. Some big cities here. There is, uh, this is Milan, right? I believe so. This is in Naples though, isn't that beautiful? That's a neat picture. More beautiful flowers. We've got poppies there. The, the foggy clouds in the background. Lovely, lovely picture. There's a mouflon, a big old sheep. The Italian wolf, the gray wolf, national animal of Italy. Very important in kind of like, not Roman mythology, but Roman lore that, I think there's a statue in here later on. I'll show you that then. Some songbirds. This box talks about how people um, hunt them so they could eat them, and they eat them whole. It's a delicacy left over from the, the poor times when there was no meat to eat, and now they love to eat songbirds. A very old olive tree here used to make olive oil, and they get all gnarled the older they get. There's some very ancient trees. Isn't this gorgeous? This is Manarola in Cinque Terre, which is a, a very protected place. It's actually a national park uh, because this place is kind of in danger of falling into the sea, and we don't want that because it's too beautiful, so they're working to save it. These are Bosnian pine trees, some of the gorgeous trees you can find in the landscapes of Italy. Here is Venice, so here's what I mean when I say that they have canals instead of streets, isn't that cool? <laughs> I think so. However, uh, there's kind of the issue of climate change and the water rising, so Venice tends to flood, and it's getting kind of worse every year. The, this is St. Mark's Basilica. It's like kind of like the most iconic building in Venice. Uh, but they put out these platforms so that people aren't swimming <laughs> during their visit to Venice. This is in Bologna. This is showing how there's many roads in the more historical parts of Italy where they don't allow cars this out. This is an Etruscan piece of art. 
the people of Italy. So here's what I meant. You know, we've got, let me grab pencil. We've got the Carthaginians, there's the Etruscans, the Umbrae people, the Greeks were down here, there's the Latins, and the Samnites. Let's see, this is, it says south of Naples. So it would have been kind of like Greek or at least Greek influenced. Here's what I mean by the wolves. So this is the twins Romulus and Remus. They were abandoned at birth. And the she-wolf found them and raised them until they were kind of old enough to walk and talk. And they would wind up founding Rome, named after Rom, Ulysses, Rome. So that's why wolves are considered very important in, like, Roman lore. Obviously, the story is not true, but that's the lore. Here's how far the Roman Empire stretched out by the year 117 CE all of Africa here, Europe, Britannia, all down past the Danube. They kind of started to hit a metaphorical wall. Some places it became a, a physical wall <laughs> that the Romans built where uh, they, they just started expanding too hard that they couldn't fight off the, the native peoples anymore in Europe and Scotland, various other places. But it was a huge place. It was the biggest empire ever at the time. Here's Cleopatra. She was the queen of Egypt. Um, she has quite a story. She had a love child with Julius Caesar. Um, and Mark Antony, one of his generals. It's a lot. <laughs> Let's see. King of the Lombards being captured. And the Italian city-states. So let's see what we've got. Pardon me. The little cord there. The papal states we have here. More up here. There's Florence, Siena, Venice, Milan, Genoa. You can see there's Corsica. The Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Yeah, that's the... I definitely meant to say Sicily. And I was talking about the king. I do not know why I wrote Sardinia. They did definitely help out, but that's not where the king was from. My bad. Some beautiful renaissance art. You could see they started to really play around with perspective during this time. And this is a painting of Marco Polo, a Venetian merchant who traveled all throughout Asia. Here he is meeting Kublai Khan in China. A statue of Lorenzo de' Medici, carved by Michelangelo Buonarroti. If you see my Vatican City video, you'll learn a lot more about his incredible art. Here's Galileo, who did not stand a chance against the church at that time. Giuseppe Garibaldi, hero of Italy. And here he is conquering Palermo in Sicily. We've got a map of their colonies. So there's Italy. They conquered part of Libya here. There's Eritrea, Italian Somaliland, Jubaland, and Ethiopia by 1926. Here's Mussolini giving one of his famous speeches. And um, I guess the word fascism comes from a, a bundle of sticks or something, so it became like a, a symbol. We've got resistance fighters here fighting Nazis. And allies ready to invade Italy. This is Sicily up here. The automotive boom. It was the miracolo, the miracle, the economic boom after World War II. Here are some Red Brigade fighters that have been arrested. Here's Silvio Berlusconi, all around very bad man. <laughs> um, he became prime minister a lot, and um, sort of like the the '90s version of not Elon Musk, but um, more like Michael Bloomberg. <laughs> Just, uh, like, you know, if you have a lot of money, stop getting involved in politics, straight up. Um, and a student protest during the financial crisis. The Chamber of Deputies here, important government building. A map of Rome, you can see lots of many different sites here. The Quirinal Palace, that's where the Pope used to live. Now the Prime Minister lives there. The Spanish Steps, Museum of Rome, Capitoline Hill, 
the Roman Forum, which you can see right here. Rome's known as the City of Seven Hills, so there are various hills throughout, and of course there's Vatican City. Here's the Chamber of Deputies in action. Let's see what else we have. The Constitutional Court judges here doing some important work. Some very patriotic people waving their flag. I think the flag's on the next page, yeah. Let's break it down. An Italian flag. Let's see, let's see. The Italian flag has three vertical stripes, green, white, and red. Green was taken from the color of the uniforms in Lombardy. And red and white were drawn from the flag of Milan. The current flag was adopted as the flag of the newly unified nation in 1870. Also really inspired by the French flag. So they were, took some inspiration from the French Revolution during their own revolution. The various regions of Italy as it is today. Lots of fruit for sale. <laughs> Some yummy looking peaches. Resources map. You can see they have just about everything. <laughs> Mining, farming, livestock, uh, even a little bit of oil too. Um, some stock trading there. And cool bill road here. Isn't that neat? Looks like an old Roman aqueduct and some steel manufacturing. Working on the computers. This is talking about women at work and how that's increasing and developing some textiles. Um, chocolate making school. Of course, lots of delicious food. Here's another great picture of the Colosseum. And what used to happen in the Colosseum in the ancient Roman times. Isn't this gorgeous? This is in Tuscany. Beautiful old town. Some marble. Very important to uh, medieval and Renaissance Italian art. And Venice is famous for its Venetian glass. That pretty. Some solar farms here. And Italy uses the Euro. Lots of wonderful faces here. This is an immigrant selling some bracelets. You know what's neat? Um, when I was in Paris 20 years ago, a guy just like this, like basically ran up to me when I was exploring Paris with one of these and he laced a really pretty bracelet with these kind of strings. And he goes, where are you from? And I was like, America. And he was like, oh, this was 20 years ago, right? He's like, oh, we love George W. Bush. And I was like, really? <laughs> I didn't say anything. He was like, no, George W. Bush is wonderful. And he made me a red, white, and blue bracelet. And then of course he was like, now give me money. You know, I, I gave him uh, quite a bit of euros which the, the people I was with was like, don't give him that much. And I was like, no, I love it. But um, I remember that because I actually found this bracelet the other day. I still have it. I really liked it. I thought it was sweet. I don't care if he was, you know, just trying to get money from a tourist. I liked it. I wore that bracelet for a long time. It fell off after like two months. Anyway, that's a story. Some Sikh people here. Many different religions throughout Italy. Uh, but Roman Catholicism is the most dominant one. I did not mention this during the um, like 1890s up until World War I. There was a lot of economic strife. There's a mass exodus of people from Italy. The majority of them went to the United States. And that's why we have so many Italian people here. Uh, here's a population map. And a little family there. There's Nona back there. And then the whole family. Italy's one of those countries where, like, um, the kids live with the parents until they get married, and then once the parents retire, they live with the adult kids. A menu here, some delicious food. Let's see, what are we going to order? I want lasagna. That sounds good. Spaghetti, or pomodoro, yum, yum, yum. Or a club sandwich. <laughs> Uh, in Italy, they talk a lot with their hands. It's 
very famous part of Italian culture. I do that too quite a bit. It's um the reason that when I'm doing the geography bits, my hands are like flying all over the place. So um, it's not really relaxing, but I can't help it. I I talk with my hands. The more relaxing I try to get, the more crazy my hands go. <laughs> Some altar boys here. The Catholic. Ooh, it's like a parade. Look at this beautiful like Madonna figure back there. The Pantheon here. Wow. It says this was a temple built about 27 BCE, and now it is a church. Here's Pope Francis, the current Pope in the Vatican. Here's the Vatican and the Swiss Guard that protects the Pope. The Cathedral of Modena. It's a very beautiful building. And here's a cute little girl getting her first communion. This is at a Greek Orthodox Church. Like I said, the majority is Roman Catholic, but there are many other religions, and actually Italy is one of those countries that has a lot of um, non-religious or atheist or agnostic people, but we've got um, Orthodox Christians, we've got Muslims here, you can see them praying in their mosque, we have Jews here, and we have some nuns. Um, going back to Catholicism, they're making a newspaper magazine. That sounds fun. Here's a statue of Dante looking very scowly. Sad that the girl he had a crush on died, so he wrote a whole book about it. Um, Dario Fo, very famous uh, playwright. We've got Umberto Eco, a novelist. And there's Pinocchio. <laughs> No, okay. The Sistine Chapel painted by Michelangelo. Again, check out my Vatican video. We go over the Sistine Chapel in detail. Leonardo da Vinci was well ahead of his time. This, I think, is his attempt to invent helicopters. Um, he really did try. He invented scissors, like the scissors we have today. That's da Vinci. And of course, he was an incredibly accomplished artist. Painted the Mona Lisa, the Last Supper many 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 beautiful works of art he was i mean he sketched this oh no he didn't that's not one of his sketches of him um but i think it's a painting of him he made a lot of sketches of himself that was not one of them um some beautiful bronze work here this is for the baptistry of the florence cathedral that's pretty and some more modern looking art this is by um Medeo modigliani Pavarotti, probably the most famous tenor in Italian opera. Next, now it's Andrea Bocelli, but Pavarotti's an icon. The Bicycle Thief, um, one of the first great Italian films. This is Anna Magnani, a famous Italian actress. There have been many, many, many different Italian actors and actresses and filmmakers out of Italy. Not to mention all the spaghetti westerns, all the uh, cowboy Clint Eastwood movies, you know, uh, came from Italy. They were filmed in Italy, I should say. A big old race in the town of Siena. All the towns have their own little customs and festivals and things. They're all very distinct. It says this one dates back to the 1600s. This is Valentina Vizzali, um Olympic gold medal winning. I want to say Anyway, um, yeah, I want to say, it's a victory. Anyway, very famous fencer. <laughs> Enjoying the nice day out on your bike there. Let's see, he's got some cappuccino. This is Fabiola Genotti. Um, a famous scientist. She um, helped find the Higgs boson particle, which uh, kind of creeps me out. It's one of those things like I can't think about it for too long or I get bothered. Some delicious gelato. This is supposed to be an example of Mediterranean diet, which is uh, yummy. And of course, pizza. Pizza is my favorite. I would absolutely rip that apart. It looks so good. We've got lots of different cheeses and a caprese salad, which is just 
um, seasoned tomatoes and cheese and basil. We've got a big old parade here that's on Republic Day. And playing on the beach. <laughs> another kind of weird tradition this is in Florence they play this game which is like a combination of soccer American football they wear colorful traditional clothes and they're allowed to just like beat each other up like it's way more physical than American football here's another one this is carnival in Venice lots of intricate costumes and various masks and that's La Befana she's the Santa Claus of Italy she'll Pedal down the boat to bring you some gifts on Epiphany on January 6th. And that's the end of our book. Isn't that so interesting? Anyway, ooh, I forgot. When I was reading this book, I was like, oh yeah, listen to that. Anyway, it's a really squeaky book. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'll have another video about Italy for you tomorrow, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night. Good night.